interpreted as a projection to a higher dimensional space and uh, why that makes sense. So why um, there is a point in projecting data to higher dimensional spaces. And we will see a proof of a theorem that states that uh, uh, such high dimensional spaces are richer in the sense of uh, allowing more uh, linear dichotomies to be built. And in the very end, we will look uh, at model selection from a practical point of view. Now, as a visual introduction, uh, I'm showing you an applet uh, programmed by these uh, gentlemen here. And I can uh, put a couple of uh, dots in this uh, two-dimensional feature space. And I can uh, pick a couple of dots from the other class. And I can now train this perceptron and this was a random initialization. It, it happens to be already pretty close to the optimum. And I can now iterate uh, and well, in this particular case, I was already done. Uh, that's a bit unfortunate. Let's try again if I can uh, uh, find another random setting. Okay, random weights. Yeah. Okay, let's try again. Okay, and the system, yes, it learns, uh, you know, the discrimination between those two classes. Okay, uh, now this may look uh, trivial to you, but uh, imagine the excitement uh, in the late 50s when this was first developed. So, uh, you know, this is when uh, computers uh, with uh, less power than your pocket calculator, if you still ha own one at all, you know, they fill you know, more space than this room uh, provides. And uh, well, it was the early days of space flight and uh, boundless optimism and uh, technological progress. Uh, it was the, the dawn of uh, cybernetics and people were dreaming of robots and all that. And suddenly you could build a device that learns by itself, the perceptron. So uh, it, was, uh, it was fantastic and uh, created lots, you know, it inspired a whole community. And uh, remember that in those days, so, so actually the first perceptrons, I think they were still uh, realized in analog, not in digital uh, computation. Um, so this uh, spawned a, a whole branch of research and that lasted until uh, a paper was published in, in 69 uh, by Minsky and Papert. And in this paper, uh, the authors showed, I believe that uh, the perceptron fails when the data is, or can fail if it's non-linearly separable. What do I mean by fail? Um, let me provide a new example here. So we have the purple dots and the red dots, and, and we see that these classes seem to be separable, but uh, the perceptron will have a hard time. So it comes in, all right. And then it has, uh, you know, trouble converging to anything sensible. In fact, it may never converge. Okay, it's uh, confused by one example being on the one side and the other one on the other. So it doesn't work for problems that are not linearly separable. And uh, that was uh, the end of the first boom. <coughs> and and until there came a second boom, namely in, uh, in the 80s this time, when uh, back propagation was discovered. So people had finally found a means uh, when you create a network out of uh, several layers of perceptrons of how to train these in, 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 a, in a principled fashion. And uh, well, in those days, again, the enthusiasm was great, not least because uh, there was some loose analogy with biological systems. Uh, where a perceptron was seen as a model for a neuron, which takes input from other neurons and then uh, provides some kind of output. And this analogy was uh, carried further by some people than by others. And uh, again, it created a lot of research until uh, people realized that it's really very hard to train these things in a, in a proper fashion. And we will uh, today see examples of that. And they were eventually overcome uh, in popularity by methods uh, that are much easier to train, so that uh, have a convex formulation. And however, even to this day, uh, some of these deep 
neural networks with many hidden layers, uh, they still allow very compact representations for complicated problems. And uh, in recent years, there has been another uh, branch of research called uh, uh, deep learning, uh, where people uh, are, are looking into methods of, of how to uh, efficiently train such deep networks. So um, let's say that in, in, the, in everyday uh, data analysis, they're not used that much nowadays uh, by, by experts, but uh, the insights they offer are still relevant. And, and I want to mainly convey some of these insights today. In particular, uh, this projection to higher dimensional spaces and why that makes sense. So, um, let's look at a single perceptron. We will um, assume that uh, the classes are linearly separable. The derivation for the training does not require uh, this linear separability, but you may not uh, get convergence if you if you don't suppose that. Okay, um, let's say we're having some problem here with two different classes in feature space, and we want to find a discriminant function. I can uh, characterize with a normal vector W tilde and uh, the full form would be given by saying X tilde transpose W tilde plus some constant is zero. So this is the set of points that lie on this on the surface and linear separability now means that uh, this expression here will be larger than zero for all members of the one class and will be smaller than zero for all members of the other class. Now this can be rewritten in homogeneous coordinates. So if I write down, you know, what this is literally, I have x tilde one, x tilde two and so on, up to x tilde p. multiply with w tilde 1 and so on up to w tilde p plus c tilde and I could rewrite this equivalently uh, by augmenting my features with a constant So I've included a constant one here and the C tilde there, and I can now write this in a more compact form by saying I, I augment my original observations with a constant one, and I simply call this X, and my augmented weight vector uh, I call W. And this is now uh, a representation of the same function, but in homogeneous coordinates. And these are more convenient to work with. So we will uh, work with homogeneous in these homogeneous coordinates uh, today. Okay, now to uh, optimize this linear discriminant function, I need some kind of uh, loss function. So I'm having an error, which is a function of this weight vector. And you can take anything you like. But uh, in the perceptron, uh, you would sum over all the misclassified samples. 
So we are summing over all those samples uh, with index i that have been misclassified. And we're looking at uh, how far on the wrong side they lie. So if I put another sample here, this problem is still linear separable, but this one lies on the wrong side. And so I would measure uh, the distance of uh, that point and how far it lies on the wrong side. And perhaps I have another sample of this other class up here, which also lies uh, some distance on the wrong side. And now the, uh, essentially these points will pull, will try and pull uh, the decision boundary a little bit such that they end up on, on the right side. So if you want to get rid of these uh, bars here, you could rewrite this uh, by multiplying uh, this expression with the uh, class label. The class label here being uh, minus one or plus one for classes one or two. Okay, so this uh, loss function, uh, as we now look at how the loss evolves as we move around this line, um, the loss will be continuous, but uh, it will not be continuously differentiable. So whenever a point ends up on the wrong side, so if, I, if I'm plotting here, uh, the distance how far a point lies on the wrong side, uh, then the loss incurred by that single point will look like that. And overall we have uh, an error function that is continuous, but not continuously differentiable. And we can now well, perform a steepest uh, gradient descent to find uh, the weight vector w that will minimize this error. So we could uh, make this parameter a function of time and say the parameter at time t plus one will be parameter at time t minus some magic step size that it can also be a function of time times the derivative. But with respect to time, sorry, but with respect to the weight vector. And this is evaluated for a specific weight vector that we currently have. Okay, now the derivative as simple as can be. So we get a contribution from all those points and this is uh, like a perfect spring. So we just have Sorry, we, we're differentiating with respect to W. So it's X, I, Y, I. Okay, now uh, this thing will then exist everywhere. So we can write it's the weight of times t minus And this derivative or this update function now exists everywhere, no matter if your decision boundary is just about to cross 
one of those observations or not. Uh, remains the question on how to choose this magic step size. And it can be proven that uh, under certain conditions, if the problem is linearly separable, this will converge. Uh, so, sure. Plus minus one, yeah. Um, so you can uh, look at some conditions uh, which the step sizes have to fulfill. Uh, in particular, in the limit of uh, your number of iterations going to infinity, if this condition is fulfilled and the fact that sum over all your rows does go to infinity. <coughs> if these two are fulfilled, then you can show that uh, the algorithm will converge uh, in a finite number of steps, but this convergence uh, can be very slow. So uh, one row that would be admissible would be to have a row just a constant times 1 over t. You can still use this update equation if your data is not linearly separable, uh, but then you should remember which of the previous solutions has been the best. This is also called the pocket algorithm. So you can just uh, store for each point in time how, how great your error was, and then at the end, give that solution that corresponded to minimum error. Now, in, uh, uh, in this equation here, I had a summation over all misclassified points. And when you look at the entire training set before making an update, then you have uh, what's also called a batch algorithm. Where you process the entire training set at once. And this is opposed to an online learning algorithm or sometimes called a pattern algorithm, where you process your training data uh, example by example. And that corresponds to a version of stochastic gradient descent. So in these updates, uh, instead of summing over all misclassified samples, I could just look at each new training sample in turn. And if, it's, if it lies on the, r on the r correct side of my decision boundary, I do nothing. And if it lies on the wrong side, then I tweak my decision boundary by just a little bit. The advantage of such online algorithms is that you don't even need to store your entire training set at once. So especially if you have a small device little memory and a huge data stream, uh, this can be advantageous. But on the other hand, um, this introduces some order dependence. So <coughs> it matters uh, or the result will depend on the order in which you presented your training samples. And uh, well, you can, uh, again, if your memory permits, you, you may do uh, multiple restarts or, or permute within a given window uh, the order in which you present your, your samples over time. So if you have a, a limited buffer in which you can store some data. 
one thing in particular, uh, there is often some kind of non-random order <laughs> in uh, your training set. So sometimes people will give you a training set and uh, the first hundred examples are all the patients and the second hundred examples are all the healthy people. And uh, that of course will, will heavily bias your training. So uh, you should, uh, these online algorithms work best if uh, under the assumption that really your, your uh, training data is, uh, has no particular order, so if, uh, if it is random. Uh, and if you are not sure whether that holds for your data, you should uh, randomize it first for yourself. Okay, so we have a nice uh, simple learning algorithm, but its scope is somewhat limited. Uh, who's interested in you know just linearly separable data? And to now look at nonlinear separable data, you can start connecting several of these perceptrons. And uh, that has multiple names, so you can uh, call this a multi-layer perceptron. MLP for short, or a feed-forward neural network. or sometimes uh, just an artificial neural network. And in particular with this uh, abbreviation uh, or with this name, you have to be a little bit careful because there are all kinds of artificial neural networks. And if you just read this name here, you cannot be quite sure what it is and you will have to look into the details. But multi uh, layer perceptron or feed forward neural network, uh, everybody knows what is, what is meant. So um, the idea is to look at problems such as the, the following. I will take uh, the XOR problem as, an, as the epitome for non-linearly separable problems. So we have uh, a two-dimensional feature space and we have samples of the class cross, and we have samples of the class circle. And uh, well, with your linear decision boundary, you're not going to be able to separate these two. Now, in uh, a multi-layer perceptron, what you do is you take the liberty to collect several perceptrons. So you can say, uh, this is perceptron one, and this is perceptron two. And you can now ask questions like, uh, I'm indicating the normal vectors here. You can now ask questions such as the following. I will enumerate these samples. So I can ask for sample number one, uh, is it above perceptron one? And the answer is no. Is it above perceptron number two? The answer is yes. And then for sample number two, uh, the answers would both be yes. For sample number three. And for sample number four, okay, and if I, if I now collect these answers, uh, this gives me a new feature space. So think of uh, the first perceptron telling me if the answer was yes or no. And so this was the answer of perceptron one. And here's the answer of perceptron two, which can also tell me yes or no. And if I now put these samples in this new coordinate system, I will have the sample number one at this position and two up here. Sample number three will be there. 
and sample number four will also be here. And in this uh, funny new coordinate system, I can now introduce a new perceptron. A perceptron three. And uh, so samples number one and four were from one class and two and three were from the other classes. So I can now use uh, this final perceptron number three to uh, correctly classify these samples once they have been put into this intermediate feature space. So drawing these uh, pictures uh, with feature spaces can be a little tedious. So there are other visual summaries for such a multi-layer perceptron. In particular, uh, one can use the following kind of coding. So one can have an input be the first feature and an input for the second feature. And a perceptron can now be visualized as follows. We have a summation unit which takes input from uh, Uh, input dimensions and we have a small bias and the output uh, then goes through uh, an activation function so this was uh, perceptron number one then we have a uh, perceptron number two. And a third perceptron. So in this particular case, we had a two-dimensional uh, input space, a two-dimensional feature space, and then we want a single output. Uh, we just want a yes or we want a decision. Is it class one or class two, class cross or class circle? Okay, and we can now uh, indicate all those uh, parameters here in this, uh, in this graph. Uh, so by the way, where do these uh, summation units come from? The summation units simply reflect the equation that we had previously seen. So I could rewrite this as summation over the dimensions And uh, this last summand here, this is the bias. And this is uh, the summation unit where we have the input multiplied with the weights. Okay, and we find all of this here. Here's the input. Uh, this will be multiplied with weights. Uh, with these weights, I can annotate uh, these arrows. Then I will have some bias added to it. And finally, this goes through this nonlinear activation function. Okay, let's do it for this uh, concrete example here. So uh, I had indicated these uh, normal vectors here. Uh, so they point in the, uh, well, in the direction one, one. So I can uh, annotate these weight vectors with one, one. Uh, and that is true for both perceptrons. <coughs> 
they just differ in their shift with respect to the origin. So the first one lies above the origin, so I will have a negative bias, and the second one will have a positive bias. Um, probably it's not exactly the distance of one, but a distance here of uh, square root of two half or something, but you know, this, this will work out okay. Okay, now we can really do these, uh, uh, so, so at this stage here, after the activation functions, I will arrive at this table. So let's do this concretely. Let's take, uh, um, for example, the sample number one here. It has coordinates minus one, plus one. So I will put in minus one and plus one. And now I can uh, multiply minus one with one, and I can multiply plus one with one. So overall, this will give me 0, minus 1. So the input to the activation function here will be minus 1. And down there, I have minus 1, plus 1 is 0, plus 1. The input to this activation function will be plus 1. And now this activation function translates this input, uh, transforms it in a nonlinear fashion. So I've indicated a step function here. and I could make the step function output the answer uh, no and yes for minus one and plus one, or I could call it, uh, instead of no and yes, I could have written minus one and plus one. This is also what I, what I really indicated in this plot up here. Okay, and then uh, this last one here has a, a normal vector I can point in this direction. So normal vector with coordinates or with coefficients plus 1 and minus 1. And then I need a positive bias. So if I carry on with my example of my uh, first uh, observation here, uh, minus 1 after going through the activation function is still minus 1 plus 1 after going through the activation function is still plus 1. I multiply these. So I have minus 1 plus 1 is 0 plus 1 gives plus 1. Putting this through the observation, uh, activation function is plus 1. So overall, I find that um, this belongs to class plus 1. If I have any other colors left, we can do a different example. For the sake of argument, let's uh, take this one here. I hope nobody's colorblind here. So um, we have uh, plus 1, plus 1 is 2, minus 1 is plus 1. Putting this through the activation function is plus 1. And here we have uh, 2 plus 1 is 3. Uh, putting this, uh, putting plus 3 through the activation function will give us plus 1. And then we have 1 times minus 1, 0 plus 1. Ah, must, I must have an error somewhere. Minus 1 plus 1 is 0 plus. So the previous example was wrong, yeah? I have minus 1. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, the p so we're looking at the pink example, which had a mistake. Yeah? So the pink example was minus 1 times plus 1 is minus 1. Plus 1 times minus 1 is minus 1. It makes minus 2 plus 1. It makes still minus 1. Thank you very much. So putting that through the activation function will remain at minus 1, and we overall get minus 1. Thank you. Um, now for the green one, we have 
uh, plus one, minus one is zero, plus one gives plus one. Putting this through the activation function will be plus one, and we find that this is the other class. Okay, so um, bottom line is if we now have a nonlinear separable problem, we can put several perceptrons in feature space and combine them using uh, one or perhaps several hidden layers uh, to obtain a perfect fit to our data. Where perfect fit, of course, says nothing about, uh, you know, your uh, testing performance. So, uh, what's important here is that we have mapped from a feature space where the problem was not linearly separable to a feature space which, in this case, didn't have a higher dimension, but it could have a higher dimension in which the problem did become linearly separable. And because now in this feature space the problem was linearly separable, we could just use a single perceptron to then solve the problem. And uh, this down here, this is just a particular notation that people use uh, for these multi-layer perceptrons. Uh, so this has nothing to do with uh, probabilistic graphical models or so. Huh? This is just um, a kind of engineering uh, uh, summary of such a network. So we can uh, create more general perceptrons. For instance, the general two-layer perceptron where we will have a couple of input nodes. as many as we have dimensions in our feature space. And then we will have a couple of output nodes because sometimes we're looking not at a classification problem between two classes, but uh, perhaps we want to predict multiple classes at the same time, so we can have multiple output nodes. So this would be the number of outcomes that we predict. And these outcomes uh, can, for instance, be normalized if we want to interpret them as posterior probabilities. And indeed, there is a Bayesian uh, formulation of uh, neural networks also. Okay, and this will allow us to uh, solve more complicated nonlinear decision problems. Uh, Let me add here uh, the number of hidden nodes. This is the dimensionality of this uh, latent uh, feature space. Or intermediate feature space. And this can be larger than the dimensionality of the original feature space. So I'm having an example here where, uh, let's say, the number of input nodes uh, would be 2, and the number of output nodes would just be a single one, and the number of hidden nodes would be four. So in that case, I would use four perceptrons to partition space. <coughs> 
would try and get the same number of intersections as I have. <coughs> it will make life easier for you. So here I have four perceptrons and I've uh, numbered them, them and I have uh, uh, identified each one of them uh, by their weight vector, by their orthogonal weight vector, which determines where this perceptron lies. And uh, just as before I had answered these as yes or no questions, I can now answer these yes or no questions uh, for each of these uh, areas here. So for instance, uh, this area here would be above perceptron 1 and it would be above perceptron 2 and it would be above perceptron 3. By above I always mean lying in the direction of the normal vector and it would be above perceptron 4 and because yes and no are a bit uh, you know, complicated, I, I'm just coding this binary as 1, 1, 1, 1. And then uh, this uh, uh, particular field here, uh, it lies above all perceptrons except number three. So this would be one, one, zero, one. Uh, this one lies above all perceptrons except number two. So this would be one, oh, one, one. And here we have one, oh, oh, one, and so on. correct. No, it can't be. Uh, we have that number twice. So this one should be uh, I guess. Okay, so uh, let's close this first hour with the observation that uh, each of these areas uh, now has a uh, this code consisting of four binary digits. So those are the corners of a hypercube. Okay, so we have, uh, we have used in this case four perceptrons. And that means we have mapped our original 2D feature space. the corners of a 4D hypercube. And if we had used five perceptrons, then it would have been a five-dimensional hypercube and so on. And it is in this intermediate space that we are then going uh, to perform the final classification after the break. <coughs>